Is doing okay this morning? Yeah. So. Yeah? Doing okay. Doing, doing okay? Good. That's good. Yeah. I'm adjusting this monitor. There's people everywhere. That would blow my ears out. All right. Well, it is a good morning because one, you're alive. Two, you're here. Three, it's communion. Four, it's the beginning of May. And you missed the downpour of rain that you didn't have to walk through. It poured so hard right in the middle of service. Pastor was like, very, very good. But with rain, waters the ground and things grow. So God, water us this morning with your yeah. spirit, with your knowledge, with your peace, with everything. God, just let it, let it overflow in abundance this morning, whatever that looks like. And we thank you for that. God, open up our ears and our hearts to the message. Ooh, was it good this morning? A little hard, but ooh, it was good. And God, if that's some change that we see that we need to inflict into our lives, God, give us the, the courage and the okay to step out in faith this morning. And God, we thank you so, so much for everything that you do in our lives that we take for granted. Let us just be a little bit more aware of your presence in our lives this morning. Amen. If you guys want to stand up, it's going to be a good one.
new song today, Million Little Miracles. It got me thinking when we were practicing it um, this week about kind of my life and all the different things that the Lord's been doing in it and the direction it took and where I ended up. And it's a lot different than I was planning on it being. Different location. Like, I grew up in Virginia. I moved to Colorado for a while. I went to Florida for a little bit, and then the Lord was like, you're going to Apollo. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it's a spaceship. <laughs> That's what I, I always thought it was. Like, the Apollo missions came to mind. And I'm like, okay, it's in Pennsylvania. I met my wife here. It's just the little stuff that Jesus does as he leads us and he guides us and He's, I don't know, I, I, I know him a lot better than I used to, but he's a lot bigger than he used to be, too. Like, I feel like I have this little cup, and I just dipped it in the ocean, and then realized it was a little tiny part of the ocean, like it was out of a tide pool, and you're like, whoa, there's so much more. You look up, and there's waves. Oh, God, you're so... <laughs> You're so good. Thank you for the plans that you have for us. Might not be what we expected. Might not turn out the way we were hoping it would even. But it's the best. You have our best interests at heart. Even when we think that we have a better idea. Holy Spirit, teach us to trust you. Thank you for leading us and guiding us into all truth. And as we sing this song, Lord, would you remind us or bring to our minds some of the things that you've been doing, some of the things you want to teach us, some of the things you want to show us. We're just open right now. I know who you are I hope I 
You know, that song's like so crazy powerful. And I stand there, and it's amazing to me. I watch sometimes YouTube shorts and things like those and videos and mainly churchy things where people sit there and say, well, this isn't a worship song, that's not a worship song. And I thank God for songs like this that make you remember all the things God's done for us. And we're going to do communion this morning and I'm going to ask the servers to come and get the stuff and serve it out to you. But when I think about all the things that have changed in my life and all the crazy places I've been in my life and what God's done, so many miracles. And I hope your life's like that too. I really, really mean that. I was sitting this morning in first service and I was thinking about one of my favorite things of how that, you know, miracles that God takes place. And one of them that I was thinking about this morning is there's a church in Bedford County on Route 30. If you're ever going down that way, it's a really awesome place to stop. It was built in 1806. And just the little miracles that people do in our lives. And one of the things I love that church so much, it's in the graveyard. If you come to the log church sits there and if you go to the right hand side there's a tombstone and it's one of my favorite tombstones because this is what it says and I don't even know who's buried there but this is what's on his tombstone it's a old sandstone tombstone that's kind of washed out from the weather and all that stuff but this is what it says it says printed the first bible west of the Alleghenies and I think about that and I go that's crazy well in case you're wondering that's Pittsburgh area that's here and as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about what that man went through to bring the Word of God, but that brings me back to what the Son of God went through to give it all to us. So that you and I have this chance, a chance at new life, a chance to see our families changed, our hearts changed, our lives changed, everything around us transformed by this miracle-working power, and all because of what we're going to celebrate this morning. And Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And that remembrance of him is that his body was broken for us, that he was on the cross, and all those things happened. You guys want round two? Are you good? Oh, you got it? Let me get my stuff. 
And when you think about what Jesus did and how much God truly, where in the Word of God says that God so loved the world that He gave. He didn't have to. I think about that a lot of times and you ought to be glad I'm not Jesus. Because I'm not sure I could sit there and go through all that for mankind. But you know what? Jesus was willing to go through everything so that you and I would have that chance at newness of life. That chance to be radically changed and radically transformed. So that you and I could experience a million miracles. And as we do this communion this morning, I want you to just think about where you could be if you didn't step into your life. I think about that sometimes. Anyone else in here ever think about where you'd be whenever, if God didn't show up? If he didn't have that person walk in your life, if someone didn't introduce you to, man, miracles. And this morning we're going to celebrate that miracle. The greatest miracle that has ever been done, and that was when a man who had no sin, a man who gave up everything to come to this earth and was willing to pay the price that you and I could never pay, and he did it willingly. And Jesus is sitting with his disciples at the table and he looks around and he sees them all and he says, I want you to do something. I want you to do this as long until I come. I want you to do this in remembrance of me. And he took bread and he said this represents my body and he said it's gonna be broken and I want you to take that bread this time and break it because it represents the body of Jesus Christ and I want you to eat it thanking God that his body was broken for you so you didn't have to be broken father we thank you and we give you the praise father for every good thing I think it's interesting, and I want you to think about this for a second. You know, that cracker kind of takes the moisture out of your mouth, and that's kind of like walking with Jesus. If you only go to the brokenness of Jesus, it leaves a, not a right taste in your mouth. But after he ate the bread, he took the cup, and he said, this is also the blood of the covenant that was given for you. And at this time, I want you to take the covenant and drink the covenant for his glory. Father, I want to thank you for coming up with a plan that you knew we would sin. You knew Adam and Eve would blow it. You knew all that. Jesus, I want to thank you that you are willing to become just like us, yet without sin. Holy Spirit, I want to thank you that you came and breathed new breath into the people one more time after we polluted the first breath. And God, I just want to give you the glory and honor and thank you for this communion. And God, we do it in remembrance of you. But Lord, as I close this out, I want to say, Lord, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Because Lord, we need you. And we thank you for the blessings. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your truth. And everyone said... Amen. Thank God for the million little miracles. Do it again. Want to do it again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We're going to do it again, Lydia. Miracles, count your miracles, one, two, three, four. 
today, but I mean, where you are in your life right now, he's brought you to this place, whether, like Garrett said, it's what you expected or hoped for or not, like he's brought you here, and he continues to hold you in his hand, and he doesn't miss a thing. Um, he's got it. He's got you. He's got you. So good morning. Glad you guys are here today. I'm Bethany. If you haven't met me yet, I'm the outreach pastor here at the Rock Church. This is my husband, Terry, who's waving at me like, hi. It's so nice to meet you. I know. Did you pick me up on the side of the I road did. today? Of course you did. <laughs> no, you drove yourself, so I come pick you up. I did drive myself. <laughs> so our mission here at the Rock Church is helping families. Changing, changing lives. lives. Through the awesome, amazing love of Jesus. Aren't oh. you glad for the love of Jesus? I'm so glad. So I'm glad, glad for the love of Jesus. Yes, Crazy absolutely. Glad. Um, my job as the outreach pastor has been very complicated lately because it keeps raining. I don't know if anyone else noticed that. Every Saturday, it just keeps raining. So uh, our next event is coming up June 8th. And that'll be a summer fun festival, and there'll be more details, and I'll, I, need, I need vendors for that. If you know any crafters, we need vendors for that, but we'll have sign-ups for that starting next week. And um, it will be a rain or shine event, just so you know. We will do stuff inside the church. Come on, guys. Let's just tell the truth. It's only rained, what, nine Saturdays in a row? Nine Saturdays in a row. That's all. Who's Why counting? Why would we be optimistic now? <laughs> I hate to say that, but that's... <laughs> It's yeah, okay. It's okay. It's all good. God's I've, in control. I've been studying the sovereignty of God this past week, and one of the things God is sovereign over is the weather. Like, he chooses when the storm comes. He does. He stops the storms when he wants to. So, like, God, I don't understand it, but again, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are higher than my thoughts, and I don't have to understand. I just have to be obedient to do what God has called me to do. So I set up all the outreach events, and then 
whatever happened that day is out of my control. And lately, I've just learned it's probably good to have a raincoat or an umbrella. Definitely. Always. Absolutely. So, it's all good. So, if you are visiting with us today, I'm so glad you're here. If you haven't been to our website yet, you can go there. It's yourrock.org. I'm waiting. Oh. There it is. <laughs> we win. Ta-da! <laughs> you can scan the QR code or you can just put in yourrock.org, fill out that information form, and I will follow up with you. And it's awesome. I love being able to follow up with people, so thank you for doing that. It's really interesting to hear people's stories and testimonies and things yeah, they is. God's doing in their life, and that's why we like following up with people, so we have that mm -hmm. relationship. It's really Absolutely. It's neat. We're going to start in the very near future, being I'm doing this faith series, we're going to start doing some testimonies of how some yes. people's lives have been radically transformed sitting among you that you might not even look at them and go, no way, and you'll go, no way, and yeah, way. Yeah. Actually, Yahweh. Yahweh. Mm -hmm. yes. That's the name of God, sorry. <laughs> some of you but it's Yahweh. Uh -huh. But anyhow, yeah, it's so cool what God's up to and how God's changing people's hearts. And that's what the gospel's all about, <laughs> is radically changed lives. Yep. And it's so awesome and cool. It is. So, also on our website, you can give. If it's easier for you to just put in your credit card number or your um, an ACH account, you can do that. Set up automatic giving, which is awesome. Makes it easy for us. Also, if you want to give by cash or check, we have these lovely green boxes in the back. Someday they're going to go red. Oh, that's true. We have new boxes. We have new ones. It's just they're a matter of it takes red. work. No, just kidding. <laughs> but I don't know when, but they're going to go red. Someday. Someday. Somewhere it's in the category over the rainbow. Of someday. Yeah, it's a someday project. But thank you for giving. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. We do. And God loves a cheerful giver. It's all really for him. Absolutely. <laughs> for the kingdom so that we can reach more people with the gospel. Very much so. And then we were at Shalakta yesterday. We call everything community. I'm calling everything community center slash church now because we don't want to just be a church. <laughs> and what is a church? You are the church. This is a building. This is a building. We've somehow adopted in America that it's a church, but it's not a church. It's just a gathering place we, I don't know, it's kind of cool. Uh, we went there yesterday or this week and we started cutting out the doors and windows of the, the, the inside of it. And Their worship area. Yes, there that's right the now. back wall of the worship area. There was a big fan in the top square and there was an organ speaker in the other one. And we got to pull the organ speaker out. It was so wonderfully fun. And it fell to the ground, and it was awesomely <laughs> good. And so then we cleaned the attic out. There's going to be where the new coffee shop is going to be in it, so you'll be able to get coffee and donuts there as well as like here. And this is all the junk we found in the attic. Actually, that's only a little bit of I junk mean, we found. That's a little bit. We actually hauled one full dump truck load <laughs> out of an attic that was 10 feet deep by about 30 feet wide. How? That's I don't know. I don't even know how they all get it up there. It's almost like they had to build it there. It's really crazy. I but don't know. we got it up. We <laughs> cut some of it up with saws and we got it all out and it was really kind of cool. And there's the old church sign from way back when that we I found <laughs> in the attic. And I'm like, well, everyone should save their old church sign, but they did. So it's really cool what God's up to and it's really amazing. And I learned something I wanted to share with you this morning because I'm preaching on faith this morning, but there's a story in this. What I've learned about building and renovation, um, I used to build new houses and now I'm, I, it seems like God just had this funny thing that he wants me to renovate a lot of things from our house to churches and all those kind of things. And I realized this in Steve Peace back there, he's a contractor, raise your hand Steve. So he's a good contractor, he's a local contractor here, he's kind of cool. Um, and this is what I learned about it. How many know this? Things always get worse before they get better. Yeah. How many know that? When you're remodeling, that is just a given. It's, I, even when you're building a new house, can I tell you something? It's always going to get worse before it gets better. Because whenever I was doing that, you walked into a really nice yard or a really nice field, and you brought in all the equipment and stirred up mud, and everything went to mud, and then you did all the work. And the next thing is, and some of you will appreciate this because maybe you're married to this person, or maybe you have one in your life, and that's this one. Things always take longer than normal people think. Anyone in here married to someone who thinks it takes five minutes to do something? Well, can't you just do that? It only takes five minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah, five days later or five weeks later, you're still working on the project. Months. So that's what I learned. And by the way, this applies to your life. You see, we did the communion. We, we talk about Jesus coming into our lives and changing us. We're going to get into that in faith. Can I tell you something? When Jesus walks into your life, you're like, yeah, it's so cool. And then he starts renovating. 
and he starts pulling all the garbage out, and you're like, where did all that come from? Like out of the attic, you know, things that were hidden that you made look so good and painted over, and then it starts taking time. You're like, man, I thought God would be done with me, but now, no, you've got a long way to go yet till he's done with you. So just let that encourage your heart. But anyhow, back to announcements. So <laughs> then, hard work. back hard to Bible work. to school. All right. So next. Sunday is Mother's Day. Yes. Just a reminder for all of you, in case you didn't put it on your shopping list yet to get a card for your mom, Do we, it. we will have flowers here next Sunday. So you can buy flowers from us, and that will benefit our Bible to School program and probably cost less than any store you go to and handmade little bouquets by some of our yes. volunteers, our church people. So And it stops you from stopping in the graveyard and stealing the flowers from the graves. Yes, yes. I mean, that right there is worth it. I'm That's just telling you. That's where all my flowers She doesn't know that most of her flowers came off of a graveyard, so <laughs> don't tell her. <laughs> they don't need them. They're dead. It's all good. Oh, and then when we do that event on June 8th, that will also be a fundraiser for Bible to School. Yes. So let me know if you're interested. There'll be more info about that. So we, she actually told me that this oh. is the last Friday for Bible to School, and we yes. had a new person register for this Friday. Yeah. I thought, God, that's really cool. I just enjoy it is, that it's, it's getting awesome. around the school that people were like, it's fun, you need to go, and I want to go now. So yeah. instead of waiting for next year, so. Yes, exactly. They so probably heard had, free um, pizza. So that's like 60 kids. 60 kids that are coming every Friday to hear the word of God. And 90% and of them are unchurched. 90, that's what's really cool. 90% of them don't, don't, go go to, to don't go to church. Don't go to church. You That's know, I, I love it. It's, it's so it's cool. It's amazing. So please support this. If you want flowers, sign up on the sheet in the back just so we know how many to buy. Like last on Valentine's Day, we ran out. So we want to get more, but we don't want to buy too many because then we'll have to. And by the way, to the don't be and cheap and buy them. one little thing. <laughs> buy ten. <laughs> ten. That, I mean, that would be a lot, but... <laughs> it would be a lot. <laughs> hey. I'm trying to make money for Bible school, honey. Some moms deserve that, like your mom, I think. She My deserves mom deserves... A lot of flowers. <laughs> no. She had me. I was easy. <laughs> I'm sure. Very easy. Uh -huh. What else is going on, honey? I don't know, but your life's easy because you married me. Oh, it's so easy. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we got a creativity class starting this week. It's a, a micro class. So the reason we call them micro classes, they last three weeks long. Uh, it's like a small group where you can learn a subject and we change the subjects up all the time. We kind of got out of the habit because we've been doing a lot of work days, yeah. but we're going to get back into that. So Fun Tony, the, the kids pastor is doing this one. He's pretty creative. I don't know if you ever want to find out, but go to Children's Church if you don't have any kids. <laughs> He likes to burn to things church. and stuff like that. That's why their fire alarm system is not connected to our building. <laughs> Just so you know. If it goes off over there, it doesn't go off over here. It's really a good idea. Just to let there's you know. There's a firewall there. Yes, there's a firewall fire there doors. too. Keep the We're doors. Good. That's why I use the other door, but keep those closed because we have an hour to get out. We'll get, kids, they'll be fine. Maybe if not, it's all good. No, just kidding. But anyhow, uh, Tuesday, May 7th, that's this Tuesday yes, at 630. Tuesday. There is a sign-up sheet back there. If you don't sign up and you come, it's okay. It's just we're trying to get a rough head count so they knows. Yes. Because sometimes Janine makes goodies, and sometimes she makes cakes and cookies. Oh. And I wonder yes. if conviction's falling on she her right now that she should supply that for the class. <laughs> hmm. I don't know, but we'll think about that. But anyhow, we have that. And then there the is last. There's child care provided. Yes, child and care. So the kids will be in the arcade area during the um, small group. So yes. bring your kids. And I just want to say thank you for blessing me for my birthday. This was my dog. Whoops, whoops wrong one. This is my dog that died. <laughs> just to let you know. That's His Brio. name was Brio. He was my friend through a lot of a really tough divorce and garbage. And he's actually standing on a place where he used to sit when I first started walking. He'd actually sit down. And he was not a sitter. Um, and by any means, he loved to walk, he loved to run, he loved, and he'd sit there and make me pet him. So that's a very special place to me. So we took our birthday money, and this is my new dog. <laughs> so This is Copper. This is Copper. <laughs> with he, a lot of attitude. Of course, he's a puppy. He's only 11, almost 11, 11 weeks, weeks old. 11 weeks old, yes. So 
He will get to be a church dog, but right now he's all puppy and he's super golden. He's a mini golden doodle and he has a golden retriever personality. Like he wants to be with every, I mean, I had him, I w had him out in the office going potty. He saw, Sam, he saw you and the kids get out of the car and he was like, Rrr! I mean, all the way from the office to the other side of the parking lot, he was ready to go. But I was like, nope, we're, we're not ready for that yet. Yeah. <laughs> so he needs some training, and then he'll be a church dog, and everyone will get to And he looks big, but he's only about this he's big. He's tiny, yeah. So just let he'll, you know. He'll get to be. But he thinks he's this big. <laughs> <laughs> he'll get to be like 25 yeah. pounds or so. Somewhere on there. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but we just want to thank you for blessing us. Yes. So I have a really cool message for you this morning, and I really, really mean that. Um, God's really been dealing with me a lot about faith, and in this morning, if you've been raised in church, how many people in here were raised in church? Just, I'm just curious. Cool. How many people in here, is this like your first go-round of church? Anyone? Well, that's cool. You're blessed. Seriously. Um, I was raised, not raised in church, I guess, kind of. I went to church first time, I think, when I was about 10 years old. Um, real church. And the other church my mom and dad went to sometimes, and I'll never forget talking my dad out of church on Easter Sunday as he was driving down the road, and he's like, boy, that church looks really like there's a lot of people there, and all four of us kids in the back seat, because we didn't have many vans, we had a seat, and we didn't wear seat belts, and we didn't have car seats, we bounced our heads off the windows, um, pulled each in the dash once or twice, all that kind of stuff, and we lived, look, I'm totally normal, it's really good, <laughs> just telling you. <laughs> uh, but I remember driving down the road, and I can remember it to this day. I can sit in the back seat, and my dad's like, boy, it looks really busy in there. We're like, yeah, Dad, can you imagine how many people you really want to go there? He's like, nope, and we drove by. So that was my first church, but then we came to a second church. And I want to kind of take a lot of things that maybe you've heard about faith, and we're going to turn them inside out this morning. And I pray that God really changes your, your life through this message, because it was life-changing for me. It, it's... I've read the Bible a lot. Um, I don't have a degree in theology. I've never been to seminary. I've never been to any of those kind of things. Everything that I know about God has basically been self-taught, where I've prayed and sought God and walked in the Spirit and read the Bible and all those kind of things and, and, and all that. Um, but this morning, it's going to be different. I'm just going to say that. So let's dive into it and find out. The ripple effect, I've talked about the ripple effect. Everyone in here right now, you're somebody's ripple effect. Something you're doing right now is sending ripples out through eternity that is going to impact lives, good or bad. Now, some of the things I'm going to say this morning very easily can offend you. But you know what? Jesus didn't come to sit here and make everything peaceful and wonderful, Jesus said, I've come to change the world. And whenever you change something, remember that remodeling. How many in here have ever remodeled your house or anything, or had someone remodel your house? How many know it's like a really big disaster? You know, you, you hope it's a controlled disaster, but it's really a disaster. Um, you sit there, and then you get halfway through, and you decide to change something, and so you tear it back out again and try again or do something different. I was putting siding on my house this week. I, we bought a double-wide trailer that I'm turning into a house that's being born again, and I'm going through it, and I was putting the siding on the house. It was so out of level that when I went to put the siding underneath the window, I had an inch and three-quarter distance and nine feet out of level. So I'm like, this has never worked. So I had to tear the siding back off and change it all around. How many know that happens when you're going with doing something that is being renovated? And that's what God's doing in your life. Faith is crazy. So when we have this ripple effect, if we obey God, it's really amazing. It does great things. When we don't, it does not great things. It cancels out those things. But I don't want to, it's a situation in which one event produces effects which spread and produce further effects. Now, that's faith. Faith affects other people, not just you. I want you to really get that. We're going to dive in really deep today, and I, I hope it changes your world a lot. So I talked about walking by faith, and we're going to do something. I, I said this in the last service, and I already have volunteers, but one of my goals in this message is to set up a slack line in the church. And it's going to take a little bit of work. I'm going to have to put a little thing into here and over there and put a slack line down the middle. But I was asking how many of you want to walk a slack line or try to walk a slack line. Do I have any volunteers for the second service? Awesome sauce. 
I'm really glad. It's amazing. I got some girls this time. Last service, it was like all guys are like, Duh! right? It's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done in your life, just to let you know. And I'm still, I haven't done it in a long time, so I probably can't even do it anymore. But one of the things I did is I thought about this, went through this. It's not miraculous. Faith is not miraculous. I want you to get that. So many people think like, it's like, one day I'm just going to be driving down the road and God's going to fill me full of faith and I'm going to be like, I can do anything. No, it doesn't happen like that at all. This is seriously a process and you've got to realize something. It is learned and there's something else. Ready for it? It is applied. It's not where God's going to just zap you and you're going to have this incredible faith. It is choices that I make and situations that I go through that produce faith in my life. And can I tell you something and hold on for this, because a lot of it stinks. A lot of it is hard. Most people don't find Jesus and connect with Jesus in good times. Most people find Jesus and let him change their lives in times when there's major storms going on in your life. Whenever things are falling apart, and God takes that time where things are falling apart, and God turns it into something so amazing and so awesome and so glorious that you're like, no way. That's what that miracles was about, you know, all those miracles in our lives where you stand back and you're going, how did that end up that way? So as we go through this, I, I wanted to talk about beginning slack line, and as I was putting this on my, in the computer yesterday, and I threw this picture on, I'm like, okay, I want a beginner learning how to slack, do it. By the way, no one's going to do that. All right. The only other picture, but we'll get into the other picture. The other picture I, I wanted to use was someone holding someone's hand, but they had inappropriate shirts on, so I couldn't use it for a Sunday morning. And they were trying to hold the person's hand as they were walking on a slack line. Does everyone understand what a slack line is? It's a piece of webbing that is about this wide, about two to three inches wide, and it's stretched not tight, tight, but tight enough. And then you get on it and you walk on it, and it tends to swing this way and that way, but it also has this going on, all right? So for all those who volunteered and you think it's going to be really easy, now I'm going to really be nice. We're not going to put it very high. That way you don't sing soprano, all right? Because that happens a lot on a slack line. I'm just telling you, okay? So we're going to do that and, and make that. But it's kind of like walking with Jesus, and it's a really good example. And I put this picture up there, and as I looked at this picture, God started really speaking to me. And he, and he, he everyone see what is different about these people? They have no shoes on. Everyone get that? And as I was sitting in my office, it was like literally, it was one of those moments where the Spirit was so strong in my life that it was almost like God spoke into my heart and said, Terry, remember what I told Moses. Take off your shoes, for here where you stand is holy ground. And, and I thought about that, and that's found in Exodus chapter 3, 5. And I want you to understand what that means with faith. You see, in America, faith is being attacked relentlessly, actually all over the world right now. There is an attack and assault on faith everywhere that you go. We have everyone trying to prove and say this theory and that theory. And, and it's amazing that, you know, we, we sit there and we teach evolution in school, and now it's a fact. But if you study it, it's really the theory of evolution. Does anyone remember from school what a theory is? What is theory? Does anyone remember the definition? An educated guess. That is literally what a theory definition is. So anytime se someone says to you that this is my theory, remember it is an educated what? It is a guess. Everyone got that? We forget that. It's like, well, that's my theory. Well, your theory is an educated guess. And can I tell you something? I've had a lot of theories in my life that were not very good guesses. Has anyone else ever done that? Like you see this nice log going across the creek, and you're like, I think I have a theory I can cross it, and it won't break. How many have ever done that? Only to find out your theory was wrong, and you ended up wet and muddy. Anyone ever find an old tire swing or a vine? How many ever found a vine in the woods? I don't know. Kids don't go outside much anymore. I think we need to do that to them. We used to take saws with us and cut the grapevines off the bottom and grab a hold of them and said, I'll bet I can swing over that. And you go run and you grab a hold of it. And your theory was wrong because it wasn't as good in the tree as you thought. And next thing you know, you're laying flat on your back. 
Matter of fact, I had a guy in my last church that I pastored that was a paraplegic, and he was 16 years old, and he was swinging on the vine, and the vine broke, and he, he was projected, and he started running down the hill, and he flipped over and landed on a log in the back of his neck and was paralyzed for the rest of his life. That's pretty bad, ain't it? You'd think so. I asked him one day. His name was Garth. He's a really cool dude. He died at 32 years old. And I remember asking him, and I remember saying, so Garth, and he was good at football. He was, you could, you could tell he was a very good-looking young man. You could tell all that kind of stuff. And, and actually, he was older than me at that time. And I, I remember talking to him, and I say, so Garth, are you mad at God because that happened? And I'll never forget his words. I was floored. He said, this is the best thing that ever happened in my life. He said, because I would have never found God in the life I was living before. And I thought, man, that's pretty awesome whenever you can sit there and say something like that when that kind of disaster takes place in your life. So I want to go back to this picture. You've got to get this. So what God is saying is I cannot walk in faith when I have something man-made in between me and the faith. Everyone get that? I've got to have my shoes off. You cannot, and I mean this with all my heart, you cannot walk a slack line in shoes. Do you know why? You have to feel it. You have to sit there and your, your foot tells you where it is and how it goes and how it moves and all those kind of things. In my shoe, I can't do that. And we've got to realize something. Walking by faith, I can't do faith if I am going to have man's stuff in between me and faith. I've got to sit there and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe in you. Now listen, the world sits there and says, you can't have blind faith. I'm not talking about having blind faith. I'm talking about having faith that connects me to that faith, that slack line below me where I can feel it and people sit there and say, how do you do that? I'm not just doing it magically. It might look like magic to you, but you see my feet are connected to that slack line and I understand that guess what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but when I put man-made things in between there, I've got to make up my mind. Am I going to believe what man says or am I going to believe what God says? And that's where the battle rages in all of our hearts. Because we want proof. And I want you to get this. I, all over YouTube, and you can do searches everywhere and, and, and talk about it, and you can type in finding the Ark of the Covenant and finding the Ark, Noah's Ark, and all those kind of things. And there's people all over the world that want to find proof and prove to God that here, this is God. Can I tell you a reason why none of that is there? God said you have to walk by faith and not by sight. Can I tell you something? Somewhere, if there's any remains of the ark, uh, of Noah's ark, it's somewhere on this earth, but God does not want you to see it and say, here is Noah's ark. Look, there it is. See, the Bible is true. God said we have to walk by faith and not by sight. I've got to walk by that connection between my body, my spirit, and that slack line, I've got to be able to feel it, and I can't do it with my shoes on, I can't do it with socks on, I can't do it with tape on, I've got to do it where it's me and God connected, where God reveals things into my heart and reveals things into my life, where you stand there and you go, how do you know God's real? Because I know God's real. And you know what, you can sit there and say, well, science says, I know God's real. I know beyond a shadow of doubt that he's the Alpha and the Omega. And, and there's people that are out there after the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Old Testament where God lived, basically. We'll just leave it there because I don't want to get into that. But there's people that say, if I could just find the Ark of the Covenant, I, just, I would really believe. No, you would not. How do you know that? Because all of Israel could see God, and there was even a time where God actually spoke to them, and the earth trembled, and yet right after that, just a few short moments after that, they're sitting there, and they're building an ark of the uh, golden calf. And they say, let's go back to Egypt. We think if we can see something, we'll believe. It's not at all what works. Faith is, is, is greater than that. You know, everyone walked in this room today, and you all sat down in your chairs, and you had faith that they would hold you. Not one of went over and went, oh, I wonder if this sucker is going to hold me. Yeah, my butt's not too big. It should. You didn't do that. Why didn't you do that? Because all of you have sat on chairs a lot of times, right? And you know that it holds you. You see, that is trusting faith. Someday, I just really want to rig it. 
I wish I had like a magic lever to pull and all of a sudden like three people just went pull them. I'm like, how'd that feel for you, huh? That'd be good. I wonder if I can figure that out. If you see a rope up here someday and it's tied to your chair, you might want to move. Because you know I set that up so that it would happen that way. I just let you know that, okay. But no, you all understand what I'm saying? You see, if I'm going to walk with God, I've got to remove all my man garbage, man-made stuff in my life, and I've got to connect with God. You see, that's what is the biggest problem in our church world, is we want to have faith, but we want to do it with our minds. Now, don't worry. There's somebody watching this and says, well, if you can't prove it by your mind, it's not real. How many of you take ibuprofen every time you get a headache, but you have no clue if there's ibuprofen in there or not? Well, it says on the label. How many know labels lie? A lot of you don't know this, but there's also in the medical world called sugar pills, right? And you need something for your pain, and they subscribe it for you, and you take it, and you, how do you feel? I feel so much better now. I feel so much clearer now. Uh, there's nothing in there. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, people sit there and say, I don't do believe anything unless it's absolute proof. When's the last time you took the oil out of your car and licked it to make sure it was absolute proof oil? <laughs> I need a new spark plug. I'm going to put it in my car. Oh, yeah, that juice me up. You see, so we really don't work on absolute proof. I point at a receptacle and I say there's power there. Right there, but that one up there, there's power there. How many know if somebody says there's power there, you're going to handle it a whole lot differently than you have to sit there and say there's no power there? What are you believing? You didn't prove it. How many have ever been told there's no power there and found power there? <laughs> yes, you understand then that you check the breaker and the other person. How many ever snuck up beside and somebody working on an outlet and went, Bzz! Guaranteed to make them really good friends of yours for the rest of your life. <laughs> How many know everyone looks in this room, you can't tell where power is. Do you all get that? You don't know if there's power in any outlet. I could build a whole house with no power and I say, there's power there. How, where's the proof? When you turn it on, you know there's power, right? God is that same way. You don't find the power in God until you connect to the power of God. As long as I look at that outlet and I say there's power there, I don't know until I what? Plug something in or I go and touch the wires. And if you touch the wires, how many know you'll know there's power there? And you'll be treated differently from that day on. I remember the first time when I, I had an electronics degree and went to electronics, so we played with power all the time and stuff like that. But I remember I was getting trained by Xerox on a piece of equipment, a computer type thing, and I, I was working on it, and I, I was stupid. Everyone say stupid. We had bus fuses back at that time, and bus fuses was glass in the middle with a little thing in it and two little silver ends, and I grabbed it by both ends and I stuck it in. And I had it plugged in. And I remember walking into the room with the instructor, and I'm like, Nian, you'll never believe what happened to me. And he looked at me and went, I would exactly believe what happened to you. <laughs> now, if you've never done it, you don't know what happened. But you know what? Whenever you hold a fuse on both ends and you put it in there, it gives you a very interesting feeling in your arm. And literally, it makes you go like this and go, ooh, there's a little power there. Yeah, well, how many ever grabbed a hold of an electric fence? How many never grabbed a hold of an electric fence? How many, someone in here have an electric fence thing that we can build an electric fence around the church? <laughs> and let people experience it? We could have a shock Sunday. It's shocking Sunday morning. Grab the fence. Is there power or isn't there power? And have a little dial, we spin it. Oh, it could be so fun. I'll have to work on that. That might be my next power message. If you've never been around an electric fence, you can't tell when a fence has electricity in it, can you? You see, we want proof, but we have to understand that that's God. God is that same way. And if we're going to walk by faith, the only way, how many know that if I walk up to an electric fence with a glove on, I'm not going to get shocked? Most likely, unless your glove has a hole in it, or it's not quite thick enough. There's a few standards there, but, but how many know that if I walk up with my hand on, 
like this, and I walk up and I grab a hold of an electric fence. If you don't know this, you will get shocked. I tormented many a cow in my days. You see, all cows where I lived were like dairy cows, and they all wanted the grass on the other side of the fence. So I'm going to tell you a trick. Don't try this at home, but it's proven, okay? So you get green grass, and they want the really long stuff, and you put it in their mouth, and they start chewing, and then you let go of it. And it lands on the electric fence, which said makes their tongue get really excited, and they run away. You know what I learned about that experiment? It was my theory. <laughs> it's kind of like a lot of dumb people who keep playing with sin. You know what they do? You stand there, they come back for more. Now, how many know that's pretty dumb? Poor Scump's mama said stupid is as stupid does, and that's pretty stupid. But seriously, you got to get it. Yes, we were bored. It was farm country. You find things to entertain you. You can only ride your bicycle so many times. We didn't have video games. It was much more fun doing that to cows, just to let you know. And the farmers didn't care. They thought it was funny, all right? Just to let you know. But anyhow, back to this message. So I've got to be willing to go barefoot. I've got to be willing to remove all of my man-made garbage with God. Now, we're talking about faith. Now, I'm all right, let's, let's get deep in this because we're going to go really deep in this. So Luke chapter 13, verse number 19 is one of those faith chapters that you hear quoted a lot of times in the Bible, and we like to talk about faith, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So this is what it says. It is like unto a grain of mustard seed. All right, everyone got that? Grain of mustard seed. Well, that's kind of interesting. How many of you ever studied mustard? No? Oh, you're going to learn a lot about mustard today. I never studied mustard today before this. Yesterday when I was sitting in my office, I'm like, okay, I want to learn about mustard. So I started studying about mustard. I was amazed about mustard. Mustard is really kind of cool, and you're going to like this. He said, it's like a grain of mustard seed which a man took and cast into his own garden, and it grew. He goes on and says, it became a tree, and the birds flying, we won't get into that too much, of heaven lodged in the branches thereof. So they came in and they landed in the branches because of this, this, this seed that, everyone, how many ever had a mustard seed? How many know what they look like? Raise your hand if you ever got a mustard seed. Man, we're going to have to educate somebody. We're going to have to have mustard seed shock Sunday. To get your mustard seed, you've got to crawl through the fence. <laughs> it's going, this is going to be really good, and then your chair is going to collapse in the middle of it all. Man, we're going to have a good Sunday. There's going to be lots of people in church that Sunday, not too many the next one, but it's going to be good for that Sunday. Anyhow, you just got to laugh about this stuff. I want you to get faith. If I can get you to laugh to get faith, then I want you to get faith. But faith moves God. So he talks about a mustard seed. So if you want to know how big a mustard seed is, take your two fingers and put them together like this. And these two fingers, put them together and touch them. And look through that little tiny hole. That is a mustard seed. It's how big it is. It's teeny. It's not big. It's round. It's like a BB. All right? It's what it is. It's a tiny little seed. So he sits there and says... He has this seed. So we've got to realize something. There is an action or a result that takes place. And you've got to realize this, all right? A seed must die to produce. Everyone get that? A seed must die. Can you imagine a farmer? And right now, how many know there's a lot of farmers planting a lot of fields, right? Can you imagine me being a farmer and i got a 50-gallon drum sitting here and it's full of corn? And I say, that is my cornfield. How many know it's not? What is it? It is my seed that can produce a cornfield if I'm willing to do what? I'm willing to do the work of planting it. If I just take that corn out and dump it on top of a field, what's going to happen? What would you say? Yes, absolutely, I feed them every night corn. If it's around my house, they're going to be like, super lunch. And for about a week, you're going to have a whole bunch of deer there. They're going to eat it all. But it's not going to grow. Does everyone get this? You see, you can sit here and say you have faith, but you've got to do something with your faith to create faith. I can have the seed of a mustard seed, and I know the Bible sits there and says if you have faith as the side of a, a grain of a, a mustard seed, you can say to you on your mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it will happen. But you've got to realize something. That, that's not at all what Jesus was trying to get across to people. He's saying, I give you the potential. 
I give you the ability. I give you what you need to become something amazing. But just like that 50-gallon drum of corn that's sitting there, if I don't do the work and put it in the ground and prepare the soil, and by the way, I've got to make sure that it's a good field. I, I like Western Pay because we drive past things all the time. You ever notice where there's like wet spots or water that runs down through and the corner lands up this tall and it has tassel and it has an ear on it and it's now in August, September. But the problem is the soil wasn't right. And be over beside it, it's the big corn that's growing. Something's wrong in that section of it. Or there's something wrong in that soil. And that's what I like a lot of people. It's like, well, this God thing doesn't work where you didn't plant it in the right place. You planted it with poor soil. You put all the conditions and, well, God, if you're really real, let lightning hit my wife. Well, I guess God's not real. We pray some really stupid stuff sometimes, don't we? Honey, if lightning hits you today, make sure you tell me, okay? There's supposed to be thunderstorms this afternoon, so we'll see what happens. I'll clue you in next Sunday, okay? We'll see what happens in the story. No, but serious, we sit there and we do these kind of things and they're crazy things. But if I want this seed to do something, I've got to be willing to do something. I've got to be willing to let the seed die. You see, that's why Jesus says, if any man comes after me, he must be willing to lose his life. He's not telling you you've got to like put a gun to your head and shoot yourself. He's not telling you you got to go jump off a cliff. He's saying you've got to be willing to let your life die and let me do a miracle in your life and make you into something that you can't even imagine just like that seed. Jesus is sitting there saying, my father made seeds. Seeds are supposed to die. When a seed dies, it grows and it produces. Now, if you're anything like me at 10 years old, my grandfather died. And he was a garden. He, he always had a he had a gentleman's farm. He had about 20 acres. But we sold butter beans, and he sold corn, and he sold all these kind of things. And I, one of the things we used to do is help him plant. And after he died, I missed him. So my dad made me a little garden. It was about this big, right here, this big. I planted corn and tomatoes and beans and peas. And I was like, I was being like my grandfather because, man, that's what he did. I was expecting a harvest. And it was really amazing. But there's only one problem when you're 10 years old if you're me. Well, it's still one of my problems, but don't tell my wife, because she don't know this. I'm not very patient, <laughs> just to let you know. You didn't know that, did you, honey? It's a secret. I knew you didn't know that. So I, me, in my infinite wisdom, I'm sitting there, and I'm watching this garden. How many know you put it in the ground, you're watching it? Nothing's happening. So if you have my type of personality, is anyone else not patient in here besides me who's like this? I decided to dig in the garden and find out if anything was really happening under that soil. Right? I found this bean and it had a white root sticking out of it. Only one problem, whenever you dig up the bean, what happens? It ain't growing anymore. Now, I tried to put it back. But when I tried to put it back, the white thingy fell off. That was the root, in case you're wondering what the white thingy was. I don't know. Has anyone else ever dug up a seed beside me? Okay, so you all know what I'm talking about. You ain't that smart. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you're sitting beside her. You ain't that smart. <laughs> now I have pictures on my phone that I was withholding. Next Sunday, they're going up. I'm just telling you, you just make sure you're here. Do you believe he said he's trying to be smarter than me? Can't stand people like that. <laughs> so I put seed back in, but how many know that I broke it? You know, that's like a lot of our lives with God. Can I tell you something? Remember that picture I showed you up there of all the garbage? That garbage didn't get there in one day. You all with me? That's a lot like our lives, isn't it? We sit there and we want God to do this miracle and fix our lives. We've spent 25 years putting the garbage in. And we want God just to wave his magic wand and make us all likely perfect. But we're not. And how many know it takes a lot of work? You know, that garbage that we took out of that church that we're redoing, it came, we had to take this massive fan, and I mean massive, it's this wide, this high. 
and the propellers on it are like this big. It was a cooling fan for the church. So that was their air conditioning. Everyone follow that? Let me tell you how stupid people are. They had this big fan that you turned on with no air to go anywhere because there was a block wall behind it. Now, I don't know about you, but there ain't no air moving through block. It just doesn't go anywhere. But we had to pull this fan out to get all the garbage out in there. I mean, I had wheeler sheets of ply. I, I can't even tell you what was all in there. We found two antique chairs. We found a 1960s rocking horse. We found um, garbage, garbage, garbage rugs that were stored in there that were now disintegrated from the heat. They even took, it, some of you will understand this, some of you will be lost in this. They took their spare shingles and stored them there. In the attic. Now, if you know any other thing about shingles, that is the perfect place to put your shingles is in the hot attic. Because they'll be in perfect condition. Try it at home. Just try it. Put them there. You'll figure it out later, okay? If they all stick together, it's Steve Peace's fault. All right? Just let you know. So, you look at that. But that's like a lot of our lives, isn't it? We have all this junk in our lives, and we want God just to instantly do it. But God says you've got to walk by faith. You've got to sit there and be willing to lose your life and let me put seeds back in your life. And by the way, you've got to plant them because when it says it it did this, I want to get this part. And it cast in his own garden. Now, I want to get you, that's that's a, a grain of mustard seed. Everyone see that mustard seed? And you can buy that on a Christian website. You all laughing. I think that's like the stupidest thing in the world. People are like, I just think if we have faith in the grain. God didn't give you the grain to put it in plastic. Can I tell you something? That seed will never grow. Does everyone get that? Because in order to get plastic on, it had to be poured hot, and it had to harden, and it looks like a seed, but the seed was killed because man got around it, and man wanted to wear it instead of letting it grow. You know, there's a lot of Christians like that. You want to wear your Christianity instead of letting God change you. It's not about having it and saying, bless God. My cross is only on my neck, not because of spiritual anything. It's just my personal reminder. I can live without it. I can live with it, but it's just my reminder that it's there, and I remember, and really, it came from bike riding because it used to hit me in the chin, and it was like telling me, what are you riding your bike for, stupid? You ought to be following Jesus. And I didn't listen very good. But we got to realize something. That seed's not for that. He says, and cast it into who? His own garden. Nobody else can grow your faith but you. You see, I had that beam there, and what I don't understand about it, if I get impatient and I dig, and I find the beam, you've got to understand something. The seed is given so I get a harvest. Everyone get that? If I disturb the seed and I break the seed because I'm not patient, I'm not willing to let God finish what he's doing in my life, I destroy the harvest that was supposed to be my provision for the next year. Are you all getting this? If you all go to the cornfield and we all go out there, they're planting it now, and we're like, okay, it's really cool. We're going to have a party in Labor or Memorial Day weekend. We're going to go dig up the corn and see how it's growing. That cornfield's empty. It was supposed to, to, to provide from that farmer literally millions, everyone say millions, of kernels of corn. It was supposed to give him his food, his profit, and all those kind of things, and his seed for next year. But here's what we do as Christians. We get impatient with God, and we say we want to walk by faith, and we want God to work in our lives, and we want God to change things, and we want him to change situations. But we want to be in control how it's doing, and how we find out how it's doing. We want to disturb it, and then we kill what God's doing, and then we get mad at God. I can't believe that bean died. Can you imagine that bean should have been able to understand that a 10-year-old kid wants to see how it grows? Only one problem, God didn't design it for you to see how God works. He didn't design this earth for you to see it. That's why he doesn't want you to find the Ark of the Covenant. That's why he doesn't want you to find Noah's Ark. That's why he doesn't want to give you all the signs that you want. Some of you sit there and say, God, if you're real. You know how many times I've prayed stupid stuff like that? God, if you're real, fill in the blank. How many have ever prayed that dumb stuff? Cowards. If you're really real, God, you see, God's not going to sit there and do it that way because he wants you to walk by faith and not by sight. God wants you to understand that you can't do it with man's logic and man's knowledge. He said, I'm God. I want to love you. I'm going to cherish you. I'm doing everything for you. And I want that seed to grow, but you've got to let the seed grow. I can't pour Clorox on it and think I'm going to be okay. 
it'll kill the seed. I can't sit there and put it in plastic and some people want to wear it around their neck. Look, I'm a Christian. It's not to be worn. It's to produce things in my life so that my life is radically changed and different. So let's go to mustard seeds because i got to hurry up. So that's how tall mustard seeds can get. Now, everyone understand how big it is. Everyone do this. That's your mustard seed. It produces that. Well, I studied mustard this morning, and I hope this speaks to you like it speak to me, spoke to me this morning as I was really studying. This is what was really interesting. Mustard in Jesus' time was very controversial. I didn't know that. I thought he was just picking something and just saying it's a mustard seed because it was little, and, and, and he even says it's a little seed, but it turns into great things and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, well, that was really cool, but no, there's more to it than that. And I want you to get this. It's going to change your. It was highly invasive. Everyone get that? I want you to see that. It was highly invasive. And the reason being is that little seed produces that plant that that guy's standing beside. And how many little seeds this big do you think that plant produces? Is everyone understanding it now? So now this one little seed, this big, now produces a whole bunch of seeds. And what are they? Round. What does round tend to do? Roll. Roll. What does round tend to do? It goes quickly and moves around. Water comes. It rolls with the water. It rolls down the creek. Some get stuck here. Some get stuck there. Here, stuck there, stuck everywhere. Stuck, stuck, mustard tree. Everyone got that? So now we've got one plant that now turned into a whole bunch of plants, and it was highly invasive. And this was really interesting. The priests considered it unclean. No, it's going to get good now. You ready for that? You see, when we walk in faith, the church world's going to say it's unclean. It doesn't fit into our box. It's highly invasive. When I'm willing to let God take my life, and the first seed I plant with God in any person's life is the day that I say, okay, God, I'm tired of trying to control my life. I'm tired of trying to believe my way. God, show me you're real. I'm just going to give you my life, whatever you want to do to change me. And God says, great, mustard seed. And if you go through the process, they wouldn't say process, after that, the Bible says, follow me. So I start following Jesus. And what happens? I got a harvest now because I'm moving into obedience because I went from saying, okay, God, show me. Now I'm going to start following God. So I'm walking in obedience and I'm starting to get a harvest and more seeds are dropping into my life because more plants are coming up. And I got all these mustard seeds now. Is everyone getting this now? So I want in that point. And now I'm going to say, okay, God, we're going through that. And I'm going to repent now and I'm going to get baptized because that's what the Bible tells me to do, right? So I'm repenting and being baptized. Bless God, I dropped another seed into my life. I've built more seeds. Now i got those seeds growing. The next thing I do is I need to get filled with the Holy Spirit according to Acts chapter 2, not according to religion, but where God radically changes my life and fills me with the Holy Spirit, and I begin to pray in the Spirit and live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, and now I've got seeds going everywhere. And then the next thing I can do is i got to stand in my call. Wait, I preached on this. Repent, be baptized, get filled with the Holy Spirit, find your call. Now I find my call, and seeds are dropping off me everywhere, and now I'm walking in the Spirit of God, and my faith is growing. Now I'm looking at mountains and saying, mountain, get out of the way. You all getting that? You see, it's a process that I went through. If you've got to come to the place, first seed you have to put in your life, you have to, is say, God, I let go of my life, and I want you to take control. Remember what I put in the beginning of this message, it always gets messier before it gets better. Because let's be honest, we have a lot of garbage in our life. We've done a lot of things, hurt a lot of people, thought a lot of things, been places we shouldn't have been, have memories we shouldn't have created, all those kind of things. And the first thing God has to do in our lives when he starts growing these mustard seeds in our life, those seeds are going to be invasive and they're going to come into the areas of your life that many times we try to hide, that we try not to look at, that we try not to hang around, that we don't want to, we just want to ignore it. God, just make it better. Just can't you make it go away? Has anyone ever been to a doctor that he gave you a magic shot and everything got better? How many in here have ever had surgery? Ask me why I had surgery. I was stupid and I was on a roof shoveling off snow in the middle of winter and I fell off the roof and broke my wrist and I had to go through surgery and they cut it and they, I got a titanium plate. I'm Iron Man. Okay, titanium man. How many know it hurts? Can I tell you something, Garrett? I prayed for God to heal it. 
I'll never forget the day I was walking to the refrigerator and day after I fell off, two days after I fell off the roof. And I'm like, God, you could heal this. And I'm like, I opened the refrigerator door and I'm like, God, won't you hear me? And the voice of God spoke into my heart. And he said, I did heal you. You were supposed to die. He said, the enemy's plan was for you to fall off that roof. I fell 19 feet sliding off the top of a roof, came down on an H roof, H ranch, which only a few ones understand, hit the, game, the valley, slid down the valley at a high rate of speed, saw a chicken ladder there, a chicken ladder was a two by four nailed down. I thought maybe I'll hit that. If I would hit that, I would have went head first. I missed it and fell 19 feet down on the frozen ground into a hole. It hurt. All I got was a broken wrist. How many know that's a blessing? And when I was standing there that day opening the refrigerator, God said, I did heal you. I protected you. You were supposed to be dead. They were supposed to, literally this is what he said, you were supposed to be sitting in a coffin today according to hell's plans, but I stepped in. I had a long time to think about that, Garrett. You know what I'm talking about because you got a boot, right? And I remember looking at that and going, wow, that's cool. I still, my, still got a hole right here where they went in through it. It's really cool. It's better now most of the time. How many know what I mean when you say most of the time? It took a process to heal. You see, your life's that same way where God's dealing with you and he's asking you to walk by faith and he's asking you to surrender all and he wants to do miracles. And you know what? I like that song, A Million Little Miracles. You know, we, we look at the big miracles, but can I tell you, any big miracle is the result of a whole bunch of little miracles in my life. I have really big miracles in my life. One of them is sitting over there. She's my wife, and I hope God doesn't hit her with lightning today because I'd like to keep her around for a little while longer. <laughs> but if he wants to prove to someone that he's alive and he, she has to die, it's all good. Kidding. <laughs> I love you, honey. She's a miracle. You know how I know she's a miracle? She puts up with me. I know I'm a lot. But you know what? God blessed me with her, and it's a blessing in my life. There's miracles all around my life. There's miracles all around you that God has put in your life to establish you and to make you who you are and to raise you up, but we have to keep moving on. How many know that I can have this harvest, but if I don't keep planting, my harvest never grows? Y'all getting this? I can have a cornfield, and if I can sit there and say, but it's there to provide me money and give me seed, and if I am smart, I'll take a lot of that seed, and I'll put more in the ground than what I'm going to sell. Everyone get that? And I'll save more than I have, and I'm not going to eat it all, because how does my faith grow? I keep taking the seeds and putting more into my life, and before long, people are looking at me like, man, you're so blessed. No, I just put a lot of seeds in the ground. Jesus did it all. God did it all. The Holy Spirit sent the rain. The Father commanded it. It's, it's God's process. It works. Would you stand with me this morning? I don't know where you are in your process, but it starts by saying, okay, God, I'm going to give you a lot of life. What do you have to lose? A seed. Everyone in this room, you have a seed that starts this journey with all of us. God's not offended at all by saying, God, if you're real, show me. Put the seed in the ground, but don't play with it once you put it in. Don't sit there and try to dig it up because you'll kill it. You see, it starts by that seed and the thing grows, and to me, it's still amazing. How many of you have ever planted corn? Anyone plant it? A seed this big, and what do you get? A stalk this big. And two ears come out of it, you're planting field corn, and all the kernels that are on it. And you sit there and go, how did that seed do that? Can I tell you something? That's what Jesus does whenever you say, okay, Father, I want you to show me. And God says, okay, my son Jesus took care of that, and we celebrated it in communion. I gave his body, and he gave his blood. Now, let that work in your life. And it's going to produce a harvest. And it's going to start changing you. That change might be someone coming in and cutting out the walls of your life and pulling the doors open that you've hidden from all those years. And they go in and start carrying the garbage out. A lot of us are like, no, that's mine. Don't take that. I need that, right? Resentment, anger, bitterness. 
But God wants to change it. And it starts the process. It takes me taking off the man inhibiting things and getting on the rope with God and saying, okay, God, I'm doing this by feel. I don't know how I'm doing it. And by the way, can I tell you something? God will let you feel his presence. A lot of churches have talked, it's not, well, we shouldn't be feeling. No, you should feel a lot walking with God. It ought to set you like, it's crazy when he talks to me. It's crazy, I, I, not when. He talks all the time. I hear people say, God doesn't talk to me. I'm like, really? You didn't drop enough seeds in because he wants to talk to you. He wants to guide you. He wants to lead you. He wants to speak to you. Father, I thank you for this moment. And I praise you for this time. Lord, thank you for the million little miracles that got some people sitting here today in this place. And God, we laughed. And God, maybe we cried and maybe we did all those things. But God, it's time to be real with you. And I thank you for it. With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, please don't look around. I just want to ask this question to everyone in this church. Is there someone in this room that will raise their hand and say, it's time for me to put my seed in the ground and quit playing with God? And I just want to give him my seed. And I want you to raise your hand up and say, that's me. Right here I am. I'm ready. I see hands all over this church. It's time to plant seed. Anyone else? Because we're going to pray for you. Father, you saw the hands all over this room. God, we're putting the seed in. God, we're not digging it up. I want to start having faith like I've never had before. I want you to radically change my life. I want you to transform me in every area. I'm tired of being what I've been. God, I want to harvest out of my life. I want to impact others. I want to show them your glory. I give it all to you. And if you prayed that with me, say amen. And I mean that. As he sings this song one more time, A Million Little Miracles, I want you to think, I am convinced that if I talk to anybody, I'm going to say 20 and older, that you know there's times in your life where God saved your life, where you should be dead. How many know what I'm talking about? I've done a lot of stupid in my life. Actually, I could have probably went at like 10 years old and under I knew that I should have been dead. I mean, I crawled in coal mines. I, I did stupid stuff. We did crazy, dumb stuff. That's what country kids do. But you know what? As they sing this song, I want you to think about all the times that God has already stepped in your life, people that God put in your life, opportunities that God... You didn't just find this church. You just didn't happen to be here. There is a process that brought you to this point with God where God wants to change you. If you're online, I want you to think about all the things God's done in your life to get you to where you are right now, and he loves you so much. Sing it, Garrett. Million Little Miracles.
miracle. 